the transfiguration of Christ. O God, who on the mount didst reveal to chosen witnesses thine only begotten Son, gloriously transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may be permitted to behold the King in his beauty, who with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, liveth and reigneth one God, world without end. Amen. Well, hymn 119, the Epiphany hymn, 19th century. As with gladness men of old did the guiding star behold, as with joy they nailed its, hailed its light, leading onward, beaming bright. So, most gracious Lord, we may evermore be led to thee. Well, we begin our work taking a look at a book that we can only borrow for an hour. Um, uh, Gordon Leff. Um, uh, what are we looking at now? Oh, I guess you can upload it. Uh, let's see here what we've got. Brad Redeen and the Pelagians. Hopefully we can enlarge it some. Yes, we can. Um, Trent University Library. No cognosco ec parte. It's 331. Uh, it's when we have to return it. So they give us an hour. This was published in 1958, I'm told. Cambridge Studies by E.M. Noel Bradwardine and the Pelagians, which we're interested in. Uh, it's got some other ones, too, that look good. Tavistock Abbey, Bishopric of Elroy. Eli, I'm sorry. Study of his De Causa Dei and its opponents. Cambridge University Press, 1957. I said 58. To my mother and my father. Introduction, part one, De Causa Dei. Divine being, attributes, intellect, will, laws, nature, place of sin, grace, man, necessary, liberty, contingency, the Pelagians. Traditional background to the dispute between Bradwardine and the Pelagians. Durandus of St. Porcon, one of his precursors, William Ockham, the central figure. Aspects of skepticism, disputes, and the after index. And the preface, although this work started <coughs> as, as a study of Tom Bradwardine's De Causa Dei, it soon became plain that even for the barest understanding, his opponents would have had to consider this meant dividing the subject in two parts. The first, exposing Bradwardine's, Bradwardine's system the second relating to the climate of thought of the time. Inevitably, therefore, much of the second part has taken on a more general character. In particular, I found it necessary to treat at some length of the skepticism of and the main philosophical issues in the earlier 14th century. I have not, however, attempted to bring science as practiced by Brad Rudin or his contemporaries within the present scope of the book. So far, no authoritative account of 14th century thought exists. <laughs> Mikalski's series of articles still remained the boldest attempt at comprehending the period, but they were never intended to provide full answers. In producing my, the study, I'm deeply indebted above all to Professor Knowles, both for introducing me to the subject, Professor E. Jacobs, F.D. Uh, Callis, <clears throat> Professor Knowles, I guess, was a medieval scholar. Introduction. 
study of Thomas Bradwardin has long been overdue. Not only is it necessary in itself, for he was a thinker of very high order, it has become imperative for an understanding of his age and indeed of the 14th century. At the present, the intellectual life of the period is everywhere still largely veiled in mists. But in England, the obscurity is nearer to fog. The few gleams of knowledge that there are, as, for example, in the cases of Ockham and Wycliffe, tend only to emphasize its prevailing density. We lack means of assessing its thinkers, and we have no clear knowledge of the currents in which they moved. Bradwardine has suffered in the same way, while his importance has long been recognized. Little that is definite or consistent has been said about him. Apart from the mid-19th century commentary by Leckler and two articles by Hahn and Lahn, respectively, a few pages at most have been allotted to him in any work. In consequence, his reputation rests almost as much as upon myth as upon fact. At one extreme, he is traditionally regarded as an Augustinian, with insufficient attention paid to his own contribution. At the other, De Wolf, for example, sees him as strongly influenced by Occam's method and skepticism. Between these, there's a variety of different judgments. Rashdale calls Bradwardine the Mertonian realist, while the Encyclopedia Italiana gives St. Aquinas the greatest measure of control over him. Even the Dictionary de la Theologie Catholique and its recognition of the many sides fails to do justice to his individual role. Clearly, Bradwardine stands in need of attention, and for this, a full exposition of both his lives is needed. Thomas Bradwardine was born about 1290. His birthplace is not certain, though Hertfield or Heathfield in Sussex is generally suggested himself makes a single reference in the Casa Dei to Chichester as his home. He entered Merton College, Oxford, and in 1323, his name appears on the college register's Master of Theology. His career was, above all, that of a thinker, scientist, and teacher at Oxford. Only later did he become a man of affairs and move to the court at London. In combination of pursuits, Bradwardine followed closely in the wake of Grosseteste, his great forerunner at Oxford. Like Grosseteste, Bradwardine combined science and theology in the Oxford tradition. He did not belong to any of the religious orders, and he ended his life in high ecclesiastical office, indeed the highest in the land, that of Archbishop of Canterbury. <clears throat> From 1325 to 27, Brad Bradwardine was proctor of the university, and to the best of our knowledge, he remained at Oxford until 1335. He must, however, have visited Avignon once, at least during the period, for in the cause of day he mentioned the dispute that he heard there, in which the famous philosopher from Toulouse, almost certainly Pierre Oriol, was involved. No doubt, too, Bradwardine took part in the general intercourse between Oxford and Paris, which where he cite, is cited by Thomas Acraco as having engaged in disputation with Thomas Buckingham. In September 1335, Bradwardine was summoned to London by Richard de Bury, Bishop of Durham, advisor to Edward III, well-known bibliophile and friend of Petrarch. Bradwardine, as one of the greatest minds of the age, had been attracted into the circle of learned men and clerics, which Richard de Bury had gathered about him, and he now became one of Bury's chaplains gathered around him. This was followed in 1339 by his appointment as chaplain and confessor to Edward III. In this office, Bradwardine accompanied the king on his journeys and campaigns abroad. The year 1346 found him with the expedition to France, which culminated in Edward's victory at Cressy, his dispatches being one of the immediate 
sources of news of its progress. And in the same year, he delivered an impressive sermon on this battle and that of Neville's cross. In 1348, Brad Reed was elected by the monks of Canterbury to be their archbishop, but their haste offended the king, who demanded the appointment of John Uford in his stead. Uford, however, died shortly after from the Black Death, and this time Edward consented to Brad Redeen's selection. He was consecrated at Avion on July 19, 1349. Wow, I've been there. Did not know this. The biggest room in the building was down in the bottom basement, the vault where they kept the money, lots of money, almost bigger than the Papal Palace. One month later, on 26 August, he was himself dead from the plague in Lambeth Palace. Bradwardine, in his own day, seems to have enjoyed a great reputation for his learning and power of thought. This can be seen in his title of Dr. Profundus and the reverence with which Wycliffe was later to regard him. Moreover, that his name continued to be spoken down the 14th century, is evident from Chaucer's allusion to Bishop Bradwardeen and the coupling of his name with St. Augustine in the nun's priest's tale. And yet, however, his full place cannot be clearly assessed, although definite traces of his influence are to be found in such thinkers as Nicholas de Outrecourt, Jean de Mircourt, and Gregory de Rimini, we have so far insufficient knowledge to draw any final conclusions. The period in which Bradwardine lived and worked is marked contrast to the 13th century. It was one of disturbance and sharp change in every aspect of life. And in thought, the quest of the preceding century was for harmony between faith and reason it was now being replaced by an atmosphere of doubt. It was a time of regrouping. As E. Gilson has said, the marriage between theology and philosophy was being dissolved, and each party was making claim upon the other. The height of their union had been reached the synthesis in St. Thomas Aquinas. With him, both faith and reason had become defined and given a common meeting point. He saw one as complementing the other and together uniting in a single outlook. St. Thomas's system may well be called the culmination of almost two centuries of thought since Anselm, in which the supernatural and the natural had gradually come to be treated in its own right. This harmony, however, was short-lived, and from there has been a strain upon their common bond. It had never been easy to sustain, meeting as it did, the attacks of the Orthodox Augustinians giving primacy to faith on the one hand and of the Averroists who implicitly accepted natural standards for their speculation on the other. The former is the representatives of tradition and an ecclesiastical authority gave Thomism a severe setback in 1207. Etienne Tempier, Bishop of Paris, condemned 219 theses as heretical. These varied from denying God's existence to making him an impersonal and indirect mover. And although the censures were directed primarily against the Latin Averroists, Sigur of Brabant and Boethius of Dacia, included several Thomist opinions bearing upon the relation of form to matter such as the assignment of one, several forms to each being. The chief importance of the condemnation, however, lies more in the striking repercussions. Uh, than in the immediate details, it marked a turning point in the use of Aristotle to support theology, expressing the hostility felt towards associating God and his ways with physical operations in the world. Bishop Tempier's action, in effect, constituted the revolt of those holding to the traditional concepts of Augustine against the Aristotelian hierarchy of cause and effect from God on high to his creatures on earth. 
it gave a new impetus to the Augustinians' more personal and immediate view of God. For them, the illumination which came from God was independent of the material and sensor sensory world. They opposed the Thomist view of analogy by which they created the created offered an approximation, dim though it was, to its source in God. They refused to accept the Aristotelian relation of causes as evidence of God's existence of the first uncaused cause. They rejected the Thomist method of abstraction whereby perception of material objects by the senses provided the intellect with its immaterial form. <clears throat> the Augustinians, on the contrary, disregarded the senses as in any way acting upon the intellect. True knowledge was to be found in the mind illumined by God. Similarly, over questions such as the relation of essence to existence, of form to matter, of potency to act, the thinkers in the era following the deaths of St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure, Albert the Great, were opposed to the innovations of Tom Thomism. The last quarter of the 13th century was deeply impregnated, impregnated with the new atmosphere of distrust of Aristotle created by the Paris condemnations. Both secular thinkers and Franciscans united against Thomism, and such men as Henry of Ghent died 1293, Giles of Rome, Rome died 316, Matthew of Aqua Sparta died 302, General of the Franciscan Order in 1287, John Peckham died 1292, Archbishop of Canterbury in 1279, William Lamar, doesn't know when question mark death, Robert Marston died 1292, all took the position of the Augustinians noted above. Thus, it is in retrospect that we can talk about the synthesis in the 13th century. At the time, the immediate effect of the application of Aristotle to Christian belief had been the varying condemnations culminating in 1217. St. Thomas himself had owed much to Averroes in his separation of what belonged to reason and what belonged to faith. And while he made the distinction, the better to do justice to each, his system was regarded with suspicion by his opponents. Its immediate effect was not one of acceptance at all, but of strongest opposition. Numerous treaties were written to disprove one or the other of the Thomas tenets, and William de Lamar's Correctorium Fratris Thomae was expressly directed against St. Thomas's views. Fundamentally, the di difference between the Thomists and the Augustinians was one of priority. St. Thomas, following Aristotle, and in this sense Averroes, restricted reason to what was intelligible. Let me just do... Okay. <clears throat> Uh, its awareness of its limits had made him take the material world as the source of human knowledge. But unlike Averroes, he did not stop there. Far from regarding the world as complete in itself, he recognized it to be the effect which derived from God as a first cause. Accordingly, the natural impulse, the natural, I'm sorry, according to the natural was of the value of leading man to an awareness of the supernatural. St. Thomas's system was essentially to work from effect to cause as the only natural means of approaching God. This gave reason and the senses an essential but limited part to play, and at a certain stage they had to give way to the revelation of truths which came from faith alone. The Augustinians, on the other, in keeping with their Platonic origin, that's an overstatement, way overstated, they refused any independent value to the effect. 
For them, only the true archetype or idea from God counted. Every individual, therefore, is a subsequent to the idea, could not be the means of its true understanding or real in itself. In this way, the Augustinians saw existence as belonging to the idea. It had to come before the object. As St. Augustine has said, everything had to be known in the light of God as first truth and not as it derived from an object. True to this tradition, given expression in St. Anselm's ontological proof of God, that which was real in the mind was also real in reality, and knowledge of truth could only come through the ideas of the soul. This enabled the Augustinians to extend reason equally to fact and to matters of fact, for in each case it depended not upon objects but upon illumination. St. Bonaventura's outlook had given the fullest expression to this, and it was taken up by his followers as the main challenge to Thomism. Up to a point, Augustinianism assigned a definite role to reason, even though it was from divine illumination and not through abstraction. It had a part to play in discerning God. I'm so glad I took grad level logic courses. He just constructs that in a binary form that, uh, with a certain contrast. Though, as Brahir has said, it was a meditation upon faith, yet allowed for discussion. Thus, in effect, was what Dun Scotus, died 1308, did. True to the Augustinian tradition of the Franciscans, he took up the growing opposition to Thomism but with the added impetus which paved the way for the separation of faith from reason in the 14th century. Duns was preoccupied with the possibility of reaching a cause through its effects, his proofs for the existence of God, his denial of an analogy and causality between the two, two, two between the divine and the created all expressed his rejection of St. Thomas's methods, in particular in his desire to show the impossibility of correlating God's actions with those of his creatures. Duns re reverted to the Augustinian emphasis upon God's will as the measure of all he did. God was so infinitely free that there was no means of attributing any mode to his operations Far from being the first cause in the manner of Aristotle, God acted so freely that his ways could not be calculated by human reason and no relation could be established between him and cre his creatures. Dunn's outlook was of the greatest importance for the future. In the first place, it put God beyond the reach of his creatures by breaking any direct link between him and their knowledge of him. To say that God was so infinitely free that nothing could be said about him was to make him virtually unknowable. Although Duns allowed God all the traditional attributes, such as omniscience, justice, mercy, and so on, he offered no means of tracing them in the creatures. Moreover, even while substituting a common, univocal, being shared by God and his creatures, this brought man no more nearer to him. Secondly, then, Duns took a stage further, the division between faith and reason, and his refusal to allow natural knowledge to support revealed truth. There was not even the illumination of the Augustinians to give man a sign of God. <clears throat> Thirdly, and perhaps most significant, Dunn's rejection of any ascertainable connection between the created and the divine was to turn philosophy and practical knowledge loose. There could be no simple reversion to the pre-Anselmian era where reason did not yet stand in its own right, but was the expression of faith founded on authority. In contrast, there now stood a powerful corpus of metaphysics logic and dialectic, able together with a growing body of scientific knowledge 
to discard guidance from revelation. To follow Duns was to concede the natural standards to the Averroists. And William of Ockham died 1349, and his followers, these consequences came to pass. In his commentary on the sentences in 1318, Ockham gave effect to this new division between faith and reason, the supernatural and natural. As we shall examine in part two, he limited knowledge in such a way that everything outside of man's practical experience was beyond its reach. Revealed truth and all that was extrasensory were not amenable to reason. God's existence or his goodness, for example, could be believed as a matter of faith, but could not be proved by reason. They were not within the realm of rational demonstration. If subjected to reason, they became at best probable, and hence arose the attitude of skepticism which Occam's outlook generated. Reason and faith were so separate and distinct that the gap between them could not be bridged. Reason could enlighten belief, nor faith increase man's natural knowledge. Now, it was this very union between reason and faith which had formed the main foundation of scholasticism. Differently as it might be interpreted, practically every scholastic thinker from St. Anselm onwards had accepted the validity of reason in matters of faith. It had been at the heart of Augustinianism, no less than Thomism, and from it, the synthesis of 13th century had been built. Now, however, the break between the two spheres which Dunn's outlook had portended was given open expression by Occam. The effects of Occam's rejection of extrasensory and with it the traditional metaphysical concepts were soon apparent. The first place with the breach between faith and reason there was no longer room for the traditional outlooks. There was a change in the direction and aim among 14th century thinkers as compared with those of the 13th century. No longer was the quest for the divine the main motive. Instead, the natural and supernatural tended to become separate areas without apparent connection. As a result, the climate was very different from that of the classical systems of the 13th century. The comprehensive nature of these disappeared and in their place, to use Mikulski's words, an attitude of criticism and skepticism. Where the 13th century looked for an ordered hierarchy between God and man, whether through the divine emanations of the Neoplatonists or through the Aristotle systems of cause, the 14th thought in terms of definition. And I think that may be where we should call it. So we're kind of doing a warm up, basically, the Bradwardine and and the Pelagians. Let us pray. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor, glory and blessing. Amen. Godspeed. <clears throat>